Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sid Melcher. I'm Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Western Massachusetts, and we're delighted to welcome people from across the country and around the world today to hear from our speaker, BBC Africa correspondent, Andrew Harding. Uh, thank you for taking time out from your day to be with us. Uh, many thanks to our sponsor for today's program, Bacon Wilson Attorneys at Law. They are also sponsoring our next virtual event with uh, the Kurdistan Regional Government Representative to the US, Bayan Rahman, who will be speaking on the US and Kurdistan region, Iraq, a growing partnership on Thursday, November 12th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You'll find more information about that at our website at wacwestma.org, W-A-C-W-E-S-T, ma.org. Um, we are pleased to continue to partner with Valley Eye Radio, which will rebroadcast the audio of today's talk for their listeners with visual impairment. Um, some of you will remember that we hosted journalist and author Andrew Harding in 2016 when he was promoting his book, The Mayor of Mogadishu, and visiting his lifelong friends, Dina and Jim, Jim Shriver, who are, of course, life longtime friends members of the council. He has been living and working abroad as a foreign correspondent for the past 30 years. Uh, since 1994, he has worked for BBC News. He began his career in Moscow in 1991 as a freelancer, worked for IRN, NBC Radio, Monitor Radio, FSN, The Evening Standard, and later for The Guardian and The Economist. Um, since then, he has lived in Tbilisi, Nairobi, Singapore, Bangkok, and for the last 12 years in Johannesburg, which is where he is joining us from today. Andrew has covered many international events from the end of the Soviet Union and Russia's parliamentary rebellion to the Asian tsunami and West Africa's Ebola outbreak. By accident rather than design, much of his work has been in conflict areas. He reported on the Oscar Pistorius trial in Pretoria, and it was partly that experience that promoted him to search for another murder case that might dig deeper under the skin of modern South Africa. Early in 2016, he read about an incident in the Free State and decided to investigate. The result, four years later, was his new book, These Are Not Gentle People, Two Murders, 40 Suspects, The Trial That Broke a Small South African Town, available in the U.S. now on Amazon in Kindle and audio formats. He will speak to us today first about the rivalry between the United States and China for influence in Africa. Then we are going to break for some questions from you on that. And then he will talk about These Are Not Gentle People, which I have listened to on audiobook, and I have to say it's excellent. So please join me in welcoming Andrew Harding. Thank you, Sid. Thanks for having me back. Um, it's a great honor um, to Zoom meet you all here from Johannesburg. Um, you can't see him, but my Labrador is out in the garden. It's a nice warm evening here. He's just been digging up a new rose bush that I planted. Um, we have had a, a relatively quiet lockdown here, both in South Africa and across this continent, which touch wood so far seems to have been spared the worst um, for a variety of reasons, it seems. Um, some of them obvious, some of them less obvious, and some perhaps quite mysterious at this stage. Uh, but the reason uh, I've been asked back today is to talk specifically about China and the US and what some people are talking about, they're, they're, the, the extent to which their new Cold War, if that's the right term for, for, for the clash that we see increasingly between Washington and Beijing, what impact that's having on this continent. Um, and I, I'm no scholar, I'm not an academic, so I rather thought I'd talk to you through some experiences and some stories about, which I hope can kind of illustrate my perspective on. First of all, let's start, I guess, with Beijing with China's extraordinary presence on this continent and it's hard really to convey quite how over the last I guess 20 years China has gone from this rather distant figure that seemed to buy up a lot of raw minerals into a country that has this very very intense on the ground grassroots relationship in almost every part of the continent. So for instance, let's start in the foothills of the mountains of the 
tiny kingdom of Lesotho, which is about five hours drive from where I am. I, I was there recently and I stumbled upon an orphanage, a state and private foundation run orphanage um, with about a thousand children in it. And I came in, knocked on the door and was astonished to find that this was entirely Chinese speaking. There were about, as I say, a thousand young orphans from infants all the way up to, to perhaps 16, 17 years old, all of them speaking fluent Mandarin. And we drove a little further up into the mountains of Lesotho the following day. And we were in these isolated little villages, beautiful, beautiful countryside. And in every village you go into, who ran the local butcher's shop or the local sort of mini market, supermarket, it was Chinese couples, by and large, who come out mostly on their own initiative from poorer parts of China, looking to make their fortunes, or at least to make their success, to have an adventure. And the figures that I heard just a few years ago were that there are now one million Chinese people living full time, working in villages and towns across Africa. These are not people who've been sent out by the state for some of these vast infrastructure projects that you hear about. Um, and that relationship increasingly with Africa seems to work two ways. So for instance, the driver that I work with here at the BBC in Johannesburg, Dan, he's a South African man. His son has spent the last three years in Harbin in northern Chile, China, studying electronics, um, a course paid for by the local provincial government here. Um, I was recently in Sierra Leone and a friend there, um, uh, somebody I normally interview uh, for politics, he's actually spent so much time recently in China, again on a, on a government paid uh, exchange program, if you like, although I think the exchange is mostly one way, of Africans going to China to study politics. And perhaps, yes, to pick up China's version of what politics might or should look like back here in Africa. Um, I mentioned as well these huge cities. Um, I was in Angola at the beginning of the, no, the end of last year. Um, giant, very little explored Angola, a country that's really for so long been closed off to the outside world, been seen as, as Africa's sleeping giant. Well, it is waking up now and it's doing so to a large degree because of Chinese investment. And, and when you go to somewhere like Luanda, which is a place dotted with apartment blocks that were built by the Cubans back in the 70s and 80s, now you drive out of the capital city and you drive along a motorway entirely built by the Chinese and you stumble not on apartment blocks or on villages or on department stores or factories built by the Chinese, you stumble on cities, entire cities built by Chinese workers who come in, they build their own little town of construction workers. Once they built that, they then build the city. Now you may well be thinking, is all this good? This is a, a continent that is very susceptible to concerns about a new form of colonialism. And certainly as the extent of Chinese investment here and the extent of Chinese involvement here has grown, increasingly you hear from governments and you hear from ordinary people, their concerns about China and its extraordinary stranglehold for some people on markets. So that's people in Zambia complaining that the Chinese have cornered the local chicken market. It's also unions uh, in Kenya, in Angola, in Mozambique, complaining that actually their governments have not struck good deals with the Chinese. And actually the Chinese are just bringing in all their workforces to build these roads, these motorways, these railways, at leaving African workers sidelined um, with very little expertise and knowledge being transferred and a sense of exploitation. 
And that sense of exploitation grows when you look up to the government level as well. And you see the extent of debt that many African governments, one thinks of particularly some of the poorer, weaker ones, weaker governments who are perhaps not in such a good position to, to negotiate, um, who find themselves owing billions of dollars to Beijing, to private banks, to government banks in China. And there's a sense, I think, of frustration that uh, you know, China has now this extraordinary geopolitical leverage, not just over companies here, but over whole governments. Um, they built parliaments here. They have got this extraordinary foothold on the continent. And although I think a lot of governments here appreciate the fact that China tends not to lecture uh, not to interfere in the internal workings of, uh, of governments here. Um, and that includes corrupt or hardline governments in places like Zimbabwe. There is also a feeling that African states have got themselves into hot water, uh, potentially. And speaking of that, I was recently um, on a phone call. I was invited onto a conference call with your Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Um, it was soon after President Trump had been uh, talking about the wisdom of infecting or injecting you people with, uh, with disinfectant. So I did ask him about that and he told me that was fake news and uh, government spin from authoritarian regimes in Africa and beyond. Um, we had a small disagreement with the, on that until uh, his aides told me to shut up that I, I'd asked my one question and I wasn't supposed to have another. Um, but that's an aside really, what, what I found striking was the extent to which Mike Pompeo was pushing this idea of a, a strategic conflict, maybe conflict's not the word he used, but a strategic rivalry in Africa between Washington and Beijing. He was very open about it. He said that, he warned governments here that they were being trapped by the Chinese, by these very, what's the word, I can't remember what he used, but very onerous debts that he felt um, these governments here were being trapped into. Um, he spoke um, very passionately about American support for Africa. He said um, no other country in history had done more for this continent or ever would do more for this continent. And I think while you can argue the first half, the second half, of course, is still well, we'll see. Um, for instance, when he mentioned a figure of more than a million dollars, which the American government had given to African governments to help in the fight against the coronavirus, it was tempting, and I would have done it if I had another question allowed, it was tempting to point out that just one Chinese billionaire had already donated significantly more money um, already uh, during this coronavirus. So there is a sense of the landscape changing, of influence changing. But I wanted to take a pause here, having spoken about China's role here, to tell you a bit about what it feels like to observe America's role. Um, and of course, it, it's very different to China's in the sense that it's not on the ground in the same way China. You don't see American entrepreneurs pitching up here in towns and villages across this continent. There is a wariness. I'm not sure um, whether what the cause for that is, but there is a wariness about getting your feet dirty, I suppose, in Africa. There is, of course, a huge involvement in the mining sector here. There is big investment in car industry, but you don't see that many American businessmen. That's a simple fact. What you do see, of course, is the military involvement. And I was thinking of the various times um, in Mogadishu, in Mali, that I've looked out of a hotel window and seen a drone and heard people starting to shoot at the drones or to shout at the drones, there is a very strong perception, particularly in the Sahel, this huge area just below the Sahara Desert, where there is so much turbulence at the moment, so much Islamic extremism, so much conflict, and there is an enormous role there played by military 
troops from around the world, uh, the French, the British, the Dutch, the European Union, increasingly the Chinese in places like Djibouti, but above all, the Americans with your huge military budget, not so much troops on the ground, but a real sense of American intelligence, of uh, American drone warfare, very active, um, particularly in Somalia, and I say in places like Niger, Mali, um, and Chad as well. Um, what's also very interesting here, and I think this is where America still very much has the edge over China, is on the cultural front. There is a great lasting sense of kinship between a lot of Africans, younger Africans, um, who look to the West, and particularly to American musicians, actors. There's a much more connectivity through things like Netflix now, which is doing very well here. Um, you may have heard in Nigeria recently, in the last week, there have been some really ugly um, crackdowns by the military against young Nigerians protesting um, against abuses um, by the authorities in Nigeria, by their supposedly anti-corruption police who, who seem to kill and um, injure a lot of young people with no justification. Um, and there was Beyonce, uh, for instance, in America, tweeting her support for the protesters. So there's a real sense of engagement here. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement has also in different mixed and often quite complicated ways has been really picked up by young Africans um, as a way to kind of challenge their own governments um, and challenge abuse by the police. So that's another way that you see these very strong ties with America in a way that Chinese simply don't have um, at all at this stage, I would say, that the cultural links are much more um, at a basic level. Um, I suppose the one issue that you probably feel very keenly at the moment, and the one issue that is sort of quite ironic, and I think African nations are quite enjoying the irony, the sort of schadenfreude, if you like, um, is the issue of democracy. Uh, because of course, Africans in so many countries here have known for so many decades that elections can be ordeals, really ugly, dangerous ordeals that people, ordinary people particularly, tend to approach with a sense of dread. Yes, money and gifts are sometimes handed out, there are moments of opportunity, but above all, there is an acute sense of vulnerability, um, particularly in countries with weaker institutions. We talk constantly at the moment, or we have for the last decade, about Africa rising, about the kind of slow process of democratization. Um, and we have seen that, there is some truth to that, but there's also been a lot of backsliding, particularly in the last few years. There's an election tomorrow in Tanzania, big country in East Africa, where a strong man populist, sort of Trumpian in some ways, um, looks like he's going to win, but there's real concerns about opposition people, opposition leaders being harassed, being locked up. And there is a pattern of that in places like Rwanda, in Zimbabwe, concerns about what might happen in Ethiopia. Um, but you still have, I suppose, as Africans watch your election unfolding, and have an, your president publicly questioning the possibility of a free and fair election in America, there is a sense of dizziness of, of people thinking, well, what does this mean for us? Uh, and I suppose a real sense of, of concern because many people here still really do look up to, to the democracies of Europe and America, um, as their exemplar of you know, what they would like to aspire to. And I think there's a, a real sense of danger that democracy in Africa may be undermined by whatever might go wrong in the USA. So, so it has potential for a big influence here. I remember when the hanging chads in Florida were happening and I was following elections in Africa way back, whenever that was. Um, People 
here going, well, if you guys can't organize an election, why should we um, expect to organize one here? And I think in that democratic space, there is a real contestation for a kind of managed authoritarian democracy along the, the Chinese model and the Western style of a much more rigorous free-for-all kind of, uh, of democracy uh, that I think most voters, most young Africans, are really still hoping will prevail here. Lastly, and I know I've been rambling on, um, I would say that what I've been saying in all this it has been very much from the outside in, um, this idea that Africa is, is a continent to be fought over by America and by China. And yet, of course, Africa itself increasingly has huge agency in this battle. It has choices it can make, it has influence. It is not simply being trampled on by the elephants, as, as one of uh, famous African expressions is it, you know, when the, when the elephants are fighting, it's the grass that gets trampled. Um, I think Africa has an increasingly strong role to play, but the danger for Africa is how it handles the challenges of the next few decades, particularly climate change, which has the potential to weaken states and institutions, particularly in the Sahel band, where it's already so arid and where governments are being, I think, really made very vulnerable by climate change, and also by this democratic sur uh, demographic sorry, surge we have of a young population um, huge average, the average age here, I think, across the continent is somewhere between 18 and 22, compared with about 45 in Western Europe. So you have this huge youth bulge, which presents vast opportunities for many countries, but if mismanaged, could also cause enormous frustration and, again, real challenges for governments. And then, of course, it's much easier for. African nations to be exploited by outside forces, be they China, be they America, or be they ISIS. Um, I will leave it there. And Sid, um, if you want to see if anybody has a question for me. I have one question for you, and I apologize if I missed you saying this because I was trying to help some people connect. Uh, but uh, one of our uh, attendees wonders, uh, does Chinese development involve green projects or um, do they contribute to environmental degradation and exploitation? Uh, yes and yes. I think China is increasingly wising up image-wise. Um, and looking to push back against this idea that it is a, just a new colonial power, looking to exploit um, particularly uh, iron ore, um, particularly other mineral resources on this continent. It has been, um, I think there's no question that it's caused environmental damage, um, but I think increasingly as Beijing sets its sights on becoming um, carbon neutral, uh, in the next few decades, and as China itself experiences uh, its own real climate challenges, um, it is, I think, increasingly looking towards uh, the new industries, which are, of course, the solar industries, the turbine industries. There's no point flogging or being an expert in flogging coal power stations to Africa when increasingly African governments are starting to go, well, just because we have coal, there's no need anymore to, to mine it, to beneficiate um, that coal. You know, the world is changing. And I think what's been fascinating for me, traveling to places like Zambia, which has a huge new vibrant solar power sector, is what they call the leapfrog of technology here. The ability of countries like Zambia, Kenya, who don't have quite as developed an infrastructure say with old-fashioned telephone lines, that when new technology comes in, they're very well placed to leapfrog over those barriers, those hurdles. They don't have to convert old power stations. They simply have to build new um, and they have plenty of space and plenty of sunlight. So I think 
I think there's a real opportunity there for China and also for African countries. Okay, we have another question. Uh, I saw Chinese investment in action in Burundi, but the Chinese had a reputation of not mixing with the Africans. Is that common? Let me answer that with one anecdote. I was in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, an extraordinary, unrecognizable city these days, changing so fast. The Chinese have built railways, they've built um, a whole metro system, and the economy has been growing by six, seven, eight percent a year for more than a decade. Um, I was out today at a restaurant, a popular Ethiopian restaurant, and a group of Chinese and Ethiopian business men and women walked in, sat down at a table together next to me, and I got talking to them, and the Chinese had all learned Amharic, um, one of the main languages in Ethiopia. And they were going out, not for one of those slightly awkward, oh, the, the foreign bosses are in town, let's go out and have a, have a drunken evening and pretend we all like each other. No, they all said, we live here, we work here, we've intermarried, and we have deep roots now in this continent and in this country. And while I wouldn't um, say that that anecdote uh, proves that your anecdotes aren't correct, I would say that it is changing and that I think because of those, that sense of grassrootedness of Chinese entrepreneurs in local villages, um, that it is changing, it is, it is evolving. Um, and I'm, I would say, reasonably optimistic um, that that sense of, of cultures merging is growing. Whereas a decade ago, you heard a lot of stories about riots, about, about um, mobs, if that's the right word, attacking Chinese businesses in markets, saying that they were slashing prices, they were uncompetitive and so on. Okay, uh, what advice do you have for the US to help us improve our relationships in, China, in Africa, excuse me? Come here. Um, I think on a humanitarian level, the engagement um, with Africa is, you know, is really recognized and appreciated and respected. PEPFAR, George Bush's program, which has supported so many communities. Um, it's about fighting. It's billions of dollars that have been given, uh, particularly in the fight against HIV AIDS. They've made a huge impact here. And of course, behind that money has come plenty of experts, volunteers, uh, and so on. The fight against Ebola as well. I mean, China was nowhere in that, whereas America, not least with its Navy and its ability to just pitch up offshore and deliver vast amounts of tents or water, um, you know, it's extraordinary, it's unparalleled. But I would say that um, there's a, still a slight sense that when it comes to business, America sits back and goes, well, we have a goer, we have this free trade deal, and if you negotiate with us correctly, we will let you sell to us. But I'm not sure increasingly that that's the way um, that Africans want to go. I think increasingly they're looking for help here. They're looking to build their own companies. Uh, and I think there would be, you know, so many countries, so many cities are changing so fast. These are places people should be visiting. Um, you know, there is an awful lot of safe, lovely uh, cities in Africa, and I urge you to come and invest. How important are the rare minerals and not so rare natural resources in the U.S. and China in this rivalry? To the U.S. and China in this rivalry? There are other people, I think I said at the beginning, academics and so on, who will be able to give you chapter and verse on, on the the actual amounts of iron ore, of other precious metals, particularly some of these advanced metals that are used uh, and minerals that are used in the production of mobile phones, in the production of cutting edge batteries, you know, the Elon Musk sort of batteries. And these come out of the Democratic Republic of Congo in particular, from South Africa, from Angola, and particularly in somewhere like DRC, Congo, 
you know, a very frail state still, um, very easy uh, for corruption to flourish, very difficult for firms to, to operate in, a, in an, a transparent manner, and very easy for those companies who may want genuinely to do the right thing, but very difficult for them to operate in a way where they can be sure that their tax dollars don't simply enrich the elites here, who I think increasingly are, are modeling themselves on the old colonial, um, very cynical, exploitative, extractive sort of politics of a narrow elite at the top of African societies um, getting rich where, where, and, and keeping a, the masses still very poor. The good news there is that you do have a big new middle class developing and you have union movements, you have parties, political parties here that are not so much under the control of the big men, the rich elites, but are starting to gain much more traction from grassroots politics, from union politics, and I think are challenging those much more class-based politics here. Okay, another question. Um, having spent time in the Congo as a US military officer about 10 years ago, mostly in, and I apologize because I'm gonna mangle these words, uh, Kisangari and Katanga, um, we could see that the Chinese were coming in quite robustly. One of the questions we used to discuss um, amongst ourselves was whether the best decision for the US was to just let the Chinese become the new um, colonialists and let them suffer for it. Your thoughts? The Americans, the British, the French, um, their unique selling point when they come to African governments is sure, you can go to the Chinese, they'll give you billions, they'll build your railways, but they'll do so shoddily. Um, they won't exchange any technology, skills, and they are open, the allegation is, to massive corruption. In other words, they won't expect accountability from African governments for where the money, the investment goes. And I think there is a lot of truth to that. There has been a huge amount of truth to that. And I think it's interesting in a country like Mozambique, for instance, which is currently in the process of trying to develop one of the world's giant new offshore gas fields in the north of the country. Um, and Total, uh, um, French and American companies uh, are taking the lead there with their technology and they're trying we're told to do so in, you know, in a transparent way. But there are huge hurdles in that specific country because there is a new Islamist rebellion going on and really taking shape in northern Mozambique in a province called Cabo Delgado. Uh, and so it's far from clear whether those investments will endure. Whereas the Chinese will say, look, we may be brutal about this. We may be, um, you know, look the other way when there's corruption. But at the end of the day, you've got a motorway, you've got a train track, you've got a new parliament building, you've got a new port. They may be shoddy, they may need to be rebuilt, but we've done the hard lifting. Uh, and it's very tempting for governments to, to say that and go, well, it's simpler, it's quicker to do a deal with the Chinese than to fill in all that paperwork for the World Bank or for the Americans or for the British. Um, and get trapped in, you know, tortuous negotiations that can drag on for years at a time when Africa is all about speed in terms of development. Are U.S. universities building branch institutions in Africa like they are in Arabic countries? There's some of that. I know there are a lot of partnerships, but I would say, uh, and I'm not that knowledgeable, I would say, about this, um, I'm afraid. Um, but I would say there's more, there are more partnerships, there are more exchange programs, there are scholarships, and that the visa situation has proved to be a, a big issue there in terms of 
of academic exchanges with America, with Britain, with the West at the moment, whereas that's another area where the Chinese are far more open door in their policy, um, much more generous, I suppose you would say, in simply bringing in large numbers of African students to study um, in a way that I think for a variety of reasons you probably know better than me, right now some Western countries are feeling much more squeamish about. Can you give us a sense of how U.S. immigration policy is a factor for some of these immediate and also longer term issues you've been discussing today? Well, I hope I sort of addressed that, at least in part, there talking about students. But you hear anecdotally so many stories of how difficult it is for people who've been, been invited to conferences, uh, businessmen, academics and so on from Africa. Uh, trying to get uh, access visas to the United States. I think Af uh, uh, the United States, Canada, still has a huge draw for many people across Africa. And of course, many people uh, in the US as well as in the UK have strong family ties now, but there are still real challenges with immigration. And, and that does, I think, leave a sour taste in plenty of African countries and prods them to look more towards countries like China, even when I think most people's inclination here, because of cultural linguistic reasons, because of connections, family and so on, history, they are more inclined to look still towards America. I have one more question. Um, why do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has not been as serious in Africa as it has been in the US and Europe, considering the large number of Chinese working in Africa and travel back and forth from China? It's a very good and a very difficult question and it's not yet resolved and I could go on for a long time and I've written a lot about this. I think first of all, Africa had a, few, a good few months to watch this virus, to learn as it took over and did terrible things in Italy, in other parts of Europe. And so, and, and they had that time because Africa is still relatively unconnected. The people who travel in and out of Africa tend to be wealthy, they tend to be well informed, they tend to live in bubbles relatively. So when they came back, outbreaks, for instance, here in Johannesburg, were very quickly contained. They didn't spread into the general population with the speed people had feared. Also, governments here have long experience of this kind of virus, Ebola, malaria, HIV, you name it. Governments here have long experience. They know how vulnerable their health systems are. They reacted very quickly and very aggressively with lockdowns. And I think that bought them a lot of time as well. You also, as part of that tradition of knowing, uh, experiencing these fighting against these diseases, you have a big system of community health workers, which I think allowed people again to track down the sick and to isolate cases. After that, things start to get more complicated and more political because of course African governments want to take credit for beating this virus so far and who knows frankly whether it could still flare up here. Um, but it may be more complicated and I know a lot of scientists here believe there are still mysteries to be solved about whether or not there is some degree of immunity that populations have here, perhaps because of prior exposure to other coronaviruses, perhaps there's more exposure, uh, and perhaps that exposure, particularly in poorer communities where people are living closer together, perhaps that might have given Africans in certain areas more protection. Maybe it's also because of the bigger distances here, that sense of remoteness. But still, a lot of scientists, experts I talk to are, are scratching their heads and wondering and saying the figures still don't quite add up. It's a mystery. Okay, we'll have one more question and then we're going to let you talk about your book. Um, are the Chinese infrastructure projects subject to decline given that the expertise for maintenance and the money for maintenance may not be transferred to the Africans? Well, yeah, I mean, that's an issue I was saying about where European countries particularly try and sell themselves. Um, what you see is different governments 
in Africa negotiating with different skill sets, um, different institutional strengths. So you have smaller governments, um, weaker institutions that tend to let the juggernaut of China kind of roll in, build them things and then move out. And there has been no skill transfers. Whereas you see in Nigeria, in South Africa, in Kenya, um, and this is partly coming from the grassroots, from ordinary people, from civil society pressuring their governments, you see at least attempts at, at, at tougher negotiations. Okay, so we're going to let you talk about these are not gentle people now. And like I said, I listened to it. It's a great um, true crime thriller. Um, and I'm once I go down, I'm going to post in a link to Amazon. So if you want to get it on Kindle or Audible, you are able to. And I guess it's going to be out in book form in the US at some point. It should be out now. You should be able to order it. Okay. Um, but yes, the UK publisher, I think, is. It's complicated. I don't really understand publishing yet, but um, go ahead. Um, so, Sid, thank you. Uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, in 2016, I just finished covering the Oscar Pistorius trial, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about that extraordinary trial. People still still corner me and ask me what I think really happened. But I, I was very interested in the idea of writing a, a true crime novel. I, I grew up studying um, Norman Mailer's The Executioner's Song and of course Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. Um, I wrote a dissertation on them in, at university and I've always been fascinated by that process. I wanted to write a book and I wanted to write a book about something about a murder case that I thought would say more about South Africa than I thought Pistorius case did, which was really just a kind of one-off extraordinary case of, of this athlete celebrity. Um, and I stumbled upon this case in a small farming town, about an hour's drive from Johannesburg in 2016. And this group of about 40 white farmers had cornered two black farm workers in a field at dusk. And they proceeded to beat these men so severely that the following morning, the two black men were both pronounced dead. The case caused briefly an uproar here, and it caused an uproar for a variety of reasons. One of them, of course, is the, the fact that a generation after the end of racial apartheid here in South Africa, this extraordinary system of laws that kept white and black separate, that, that um, kept blacks subjugated, um, not allowed to, to marry outside their race, not allowed to move outside their towns, um, kept as a second class, third class uh, humans. It, um, after that ended, it's been a long, slow process for this Mandela's Rainbow Nation to go about the the process of healing and it's still a, a, a very much a work in progress and when you go out to some of these rural towns um, I think the progress has been much slower. These white farmers believed that the two men they arrested and beat were robbers. They believed that, he had just, that they had just attacked an elderly white farmer and farm robberies and farm murders here are a, a very big issue, a very political issue. Donald Trump has tweeted about them. People say that there is a racial genocide going on, that people, uh, black politicians, their supporters, are trying to drive white farmers off the land, Zimbabwe style, if you like, and there, that there's a broad conspiracy at work. There is, I should stress, no evidence, zero evidence for that. And yet, there are gruesome murders taking place on South African farms, regularly and because most South African farms, commercial farms, are still to this day owned by whites, most of those victims and their families are white and often they are subjected to horrific torture, which many of those farmers believe is racial in its racially motivated. And so these white farmers, when they caught these two black men, they were in a fury. They believed that perhaps these two men might have killed one of them, and so they acted the way they did. 
it then got much more complicated as I discovered as I begin to, began to dig into this case, because it turned out that these two black men might not have been robbers at all. They were workers on these farmers' farms. Many of them knew these white farms, some of them knew the white farmers, and it is argued that they had gone to ask for unpaid wages. There had been some sort of disagreement and an elderly white farmer had pressed a panic button to alert his friends that something was going on. Um, I followed this case for four and a half years. The case of Simon Jubebo and Samuel Chica, the two dead men. The case of the Van der Vestesens, this white farming family who split apart in the most bitter way as they started to shift blame for who was responsible for killing these two men. And I followed the case and the investigation in what I hope is really a thriller and a mystery, as well as a book about South Africa's sort of struggling racial politics and its crumbling institutions, as it went through this court case. Barry Rue, a name that might be familiar to those interested in the Pistorius trial, the Oscar Pistorius trial, he even shows up. Uh, Barry Rue was Oscar's lawyer, and he ended up cutting a deal for some of these white farmers, essentially to, to betray their own relatives and turn state witnesses. Um, I'm not going to spoil how the book ends, but it is dramatic, and it is a trial that I think has so many twists and so many surprises, and I think it's a trial that has ended up shocking many South Africans um, in the way it un unfolded. It's also a case that I ended up not just writing a book about, but um, also putting together a radio series for the BBC and an accompanying podcast, a sort of slightly extended version of a five-part series in which I basically tell the story in a slimmed down way, I suppose, but it's called Bloodlands. And uh, if I can give it a plug here, it's also available on BBC Sounds. Um, that's kind of the basics of the story, and I don't really want to kind of ramble on too much uh, in case you have, have some questions about it or about the broader issue of, of farm attacks and South Africa in general, or Oscar. Well, thank you. Um, I've asked if there are any questions, and we'll see if we get any. Um, and I will share the podcast link probably as a follow-up when I share this video. Um, so we do not have any more questions, I see. So I think I'm gonna let people go. Oh, wait, nope, a question. Is the book fiction? So um, as with um, In Cold Blood, the, the, the book I was telling you about um, that Truman Capote wrote, um, no, it, it's non-fiction, but I've written it in the style um, of a novel. So what I did was I spent a long time interviewing everybody involved, reconstructing their version of events. And then I basically wrote it um, in a way that I hope if you didn't know if it was truth or fiction, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell. So I've written it, I've constructed it as, as a thriller, as a story where you can hear people's inner thoughts, um, because I know their inner thoughts, because they've told me them, but I'm not writing it in a more straightforward journalistic style. I'm not in the book, for instance, myself at all, in a way I was in my earlier book, in which I kind of explained how I'd got access to to Mogadishu and the conflict there. So this time I retreat completely from the book and try and tell it as a, as a novel, as a thriller, but without, I hope, betraying the trust and the, and the, you know, the openness of so many people who, who agreed to talk to me. Um, and of course the, the court record, which also helps to, to piece together the drama and the story. What do you think really happened in the Pistorius case? <laughs> so I, I'm going to put it on the line here. I was sitting in court just in the weeks after the killing. 
And Pistorius's lawyer, you may remember, came in and basically said, we're not going to wait. The bail hearing is underway. We're going to tell you what happened. A lot of people thought it was a very risky strategy. But his lawyers basically were doing a, a public relations ex exercise. They thought they could get, they could avoid a long trial. They wanted to just set the facts down for the world. And they delivered this very lengthy statement explaining what Oscar Pistorius had done, his point of view. And to me, that statement was the truth. And nothing that happened in the year or two that followed shook my belief that he believed an intruder was behind that door and that he shot in a panic at that door, believing that his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp, was in the bed, in the bedroom, that he left her behind there. Um, and I believe that because I knew all the lawyers in the case. I knew the prosecution team who all said they disagreed fundamentally with their lead prosecutor. They'd all interviewed all the witnesses and all the closest witnesses to Oscar Pistorius's house, all corroborated his version of events, of the order of the screams, of the gunshots, everything else. Um, and fundamentally, I think that he deserved to be given a murder sentence, but that it was a, a debatable point in law. If you shoot through a closed door, believing your life is under threat, being a man profoundly handicapped on his stumps, a man traumatized over his childhood and grow up, this sense of vulnerability he had that he displayed in court, very real, then I think it is possible to argue he thought that he was doing the sensible thing, or at least he was reacting in panic. But it's equally fair to say, well, he should have stopped. He should have known that he would kill somebody who presumably posed very little risk to him. So I think, I think the first judge made the right call in saying it was culpable homicide. I think the appeals judge probably made the right call in saying it was murder. I, I don't know. I think it's up to you and to your sense of what justice looks like. Certainly his life is ruined. Um, and certainly anybody who shoots through a a door like that should be imprisoned, I believe. But I also think that had he been imprisoned and put on trial and imprisoned a year or two earlier when he first shot his gun in a restaurant in Johannesburg when he was messing around with it or shot his gun through the roof of his car when he was driving around being an idiot. If he'd been punished for those two, then I think this would never have happened. One more thing. Um, I have traveled to South Africa. Um, I thought that the, there was more racial tension in Cape Town than I saw in Johannesburg. Is that assessment correct? I think it probably is, yes. Cape Town is a very strange place. Beautiful, great foods, um, great wine, but it is a bubble of essentially old white privilege from the days of apartheid and it is surrounded by astonishing poverty um, it is relatively well run uh, as a province and it faces big challenges but i think when black south africans go to the, go to cape town a lot of them complain that they feel out of place that they feel that they're being made to feel out of place, that this is somewhere that people who are worried about the future of South Africa, particularly wealthy whites, have to some extent retreated to. They talk about it as a, as a sort of last bastion uh, if things go downhill here. And so I think there are all sorts of tensions there that you don't get so much of in Johannesburg. This is a much rougher and ready city that I live just down the road from a place called Rosebank, which is very mixed, very successful, a lot of black middle class families living around here. And I think it's a much more cosmopolitan city where people tend to rub along much better than they do elsewhere. You don't see that spatial apartheid, which is what they call it here, that kind of 
the legacy of apartheid of people living in different places because that was the law in those days. You don't see that to the same extent you still do in Cape Town. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. This has been a great, a great uh, event. Um, I want to remind everybody again that our next event will be November 12th which, with Bayan Rahman, uh, the KRG representative in the U.S. on um, U.S. and Kurdish relations at no, November 12th at 6.30 p.m., also sponsored by Bacon Wilson. So thank you, Andrew, and thank you, everybody, thank you. for participating. Take Thank care. Thank you very much. Take care. Good luck next week. <laughs>